Okay, so during this week's Behind the Headlines, we're talking about code enforcement. Um, Janati, in recent weeks, you've been covering a lot of code enforcement issues, so why don't you just tell us what's going on? Uh, thanks, Linda. Well, um, code enforcement is actually something that's been coming up a lot this year. It's been uh, more on the council's radar after surveys showed that it's something people are getting increasingly frustrated and confused about. And so, last few weeks, we've been looking at particular complaints that have kind of generated um, quite a bit of anxiety from um, some of the land use watchdogs and residents in local neighborhoods. Um, these include like all sorts of complaints dealing with things ranging from, you know, like illegal occupancy of a building to weed abatement, things like that. And so, uh, I guess one of the objectives of our recent stories is first of all to explain exactly what code enforcement is and what these what the code enforcement officers do. And also take a look at um, you know some of the specific cases that have been kind of in the spotlight recently. What are some of the things that people complain about the most? Yeah. Well, um, on on a broad level, I think uh, um, a survey came out um, in January, basically showing that um, fifty two percent of the respondents in, in Palo Alto think um, co enforcement is doing a good or excellent job. Which and that's down, right, from previous surveys. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what made uh, the council take notice. Um, uh, it, 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 it was 59% last year, 62% before that. So we're talking about like a 10% decline in two, in two years. So uh, the council really wants to know, you know, what the heck is going on. And mm -hmm. so does the city auditor. She's doing audit of co-enforcement now. And, and so do we. I mean, because it's such a vague term that it's like... Um, we want to know what exactly people are unhappy about. Is it right. hoarding? Is it weeds? Is it that yeah, kind of stuff? Yeah, it seems or to encompass so many things. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I read in your story also that only about 5% of the complaints that are investigated actually um, mm -hmm. they issue fines for. Is that because it's resolved before it gets to the point where they need to issue fines or, or what, why is it such a low rate? Well, that's, uh, the answer is in the, I guess, mouth of beholder. Hmm. The beholder said mouths. I don't know. But um, I guess <laughs> from, from, from code enforcement, well, it's based on what people tell me. Uh, oh, so, I see. But um, from the code enforcement perspective, the reason uh, so few of them result in fines is because they do such a uh, thorough job of giving people a chance to re respond before it gets to that point. Uh, you know, uh, I've interviewed, you know, people who work in, in that department. They basically said that we'd much rather get voluntary compliance and work with people to resolve their problems than to hit them with citations and they succeed most of the time which is why it's such a small number but of course on the other hand the critics of code enforcement of which there's quite a significant amount are saying that um, this ref the, the very small num number of fines given just reflects the fact that um, we have such a um, so many things basically uh, it's so lax basically mm. so many violators are just getting a free pass yeah. and for them, the the five percent number is kind of a much bigger issue, and it's a mm. sign that the, the city's letting a lot of things go. Hmm. But this week, um, in your story about the the church, it seemed like the city is really cracking down mm -hmm. there. Tell us about what's been going on. Yeah, you're referring to the first, first Baptist church, which mm -hmm. kind of uh, became the most recent big code enforcement story uh, last month. Um, it kind of made headlines when the city kind of cracked down the new Mozart School of Music, which has been there for like twelve years. And basically, the church is located in a residential, what's known as an R1 neighborhood for single-family homes. Mm -hmm. and it has a permit to operate there, but there's tight restrictions on what kind of uses must be there. So the new Mozart School of Music, the city determined, uh, is an illegal use in a church in a residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So they sent him uh, basically a cease and desist saying, you have to leave by such and such date. They ultimately gave him an extension yeah. until fall. And then uh, last week we learned that like yeah, 11 or so other tenants who've been renting space at First Baptist just got their uh, kind of uh, yeah. notices. <clears throat> so now they have to leave as well, which yeah. is creating all sorts of concerns from both the tenants but and the But hadn't they been there for a long time? What prompted all of a sudden now for the city to crack down? Well, the thing about code enforcement is um, basically they investigate more than like 600 cases a year. Mm -hmm. I think last year was like 723, I believe, which is like more than it's been in a decade. And they have a very limited capacity. There's three people. It was two. The third one was just added last year. And so I, th I think just the nature of the issue and the small staff means there's going to be a very limited you know, amount of things they could investigate. 
and a lot of it depends on what you know the city council and the people choose to focus on. Like a mm. year ago, like lead blowers were all the rage. For example, code enforcement was really focusing on them. Uh, now we get a lot more complaints about um, like offices illegally occupying retail sites. Right. So I feel like there's a big, bigger awareness and alertness uh, within city staff and planning and code enforcement in general to those kinds of issues. So I suspect that coupled with the few complaints from the residences mm -hmm. around the church kind mm -hmm. of let code enforcement look at new Mozart and then once it looked at new Mozart it saw all these other uses in the same building right. and it's basically if you're going to investigate one thing and on your way you see like five other violations you can't just turn a blind eye which is what code enforcement said so have right. you discovered those it's kind of following the same the same approach uh, in the article you talked a little bit about um, Joe Cooper who's mm -hmm. the counselor who um, you talked just a little bit about or you wrote about how um, it's affecting the community and affecting um, the church and how the church has been there for 70 years. Um, and, uh, you know, it, before um, the current use permit existed. Um, so I imagine that this kind of, there's this tension, right, that you kind of highlight in your, in your story about, like, how the community is changing um, and how the code enforcement is kind of um, having to uh, account for these changes. Um, <laughs> so it's just really interesting. Yeah, and, and I think in some ways, like the, the kind of complaints people have about code enforcement uh, very much reflect what's happening in the city at large. And, uh, you know, the, the city auditors right now just commissioned a new survey to figure out what exactly people are displeased about when it comes to code enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right now, the big anxiety is too much office growth, you know, and so it kind of so the fact that people are complaining about offices getting into like that CNC restaurant place that's mm -hmm. kind of being used for warehousing, and, yeah, or the Asian Box former Palo Alto Breakfast House, which is kind yeah. of Asian and Box it doubles as a so so bakery. I feel like because offices create such a kind of level of anxiety at large, these are the kind of issues that people are focusing more now than before, hmm. and also reflecting the fact that you know office rates are sky high now, so right. people are looking for creative ways to repurpose other. Um, you know, properties to, which may have retail use, but mm -hmm. you know, what's creative to some is like a blatant violation, violation to other. So, yeah. I, I thought in your article that, um, or maybe some comments from readers on, on your article about the Asian box and the mm -hmm. CC restaurant, um, that was how long it took for anything to happen right. once they reported it. So, so do you have, like, why does it take so long um, for anything to happen, where it seems like in the church they have this 30-day notice, but in this other case, it's taken a year um, for well, anything to happen. Look, that's a good question, and I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from. Because uh, code enforcement, it, it, and even though they're not the police department, in some cases there's a similarity in that their investigations basically mm -hmm. take place behind the scenes. They don't like you know call the complainant every week to update them. Hey, we just inspected, and here's what we found. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in the case of CC Restaurant Supply, you know, you had a complaint. I think in the fall of 2015 or somewhere in that area mm -hmm. and it didn't get resolved until like you know a month ago so you could legitimately think that why is this taking like two years to mm -hmm. to get it done but when you look at it from the other perspective co enforcement did conduct the inspection shortly after the complaint they did kind of not file these notices of violations they have this intricate process they have to go through so i think the two main reasons for why it's taken so long number one the attitude of co enforcement is they would prefer voluntary compliance, and so they want to give people a chance to kind of do that and go through that process, which inherently means it would take longer because mm -hmm. they're not clamping down immediately. And secondly, co enforcement would say it has a lot to do with the municipal code. Mm -hmm. uh, other cities, um, you know, if you have a repeat violator, you could kind of have a almost like a probation kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. if you just paid a citation and you basically recidivism happens, you can get mm -hmm. cited again. Whereas in Palo Alto, you basically start back at um, the Square first one. step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead. Sorry, I thought I interrupted you. Oh, no, that's okay. But I did want to just loop back to the First Baptist because you did mention that. Sure. I feel like, to me, that's a very interesting case because yeah. it almost shows like the pendulum swinging to the other end in mm -hmm. some ways. And it, again, reflects the fact that um, code enforcement is does have quite a bit of discretion as to you know, yes. where it focuses. So people were saying it's too lax. And mm -hmm. so it went after the First Baptist Church yeah. and its tenants. And, and now, now when, when you look criticism. at the comments. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, even just in reading your um, cover story um, mm -hmm. on the 14th, I was very much like, oh, man, like 
that's, you know, kind of on the side of, of enforcing, right? <laughs> For, as the reader, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then now, uh, in reading your first Baptist story, you kind of get this look at how it's affecting um, the tenants, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the issue of, like you said, office space being so um, expensive in Palo Alto and creative ways. And so I'm kind of seeing this other side, like, oh, like maybe, maybe that's a very being too stringent, you know? And so now I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I guess it's you're doing an excellent <laughs> job of showing how it's very complicated. Well, it is because, um, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say that the code enforcement isn't going after the violator if the violator is like the house next door with like debris or like it's a construction site that's been there for years. Mm -hmm. It's quite another where it's like a service that you value, but it's, it's a violator. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a, there's an inherent tension. Yeah. You said that some of the tenants at the church um, would be able to stay. What kind of, what tenants are able to stay, do you know? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, we have like 11 violations. So you said, look um, like this. Basically, the, the dance groups, the music groups, they were out. Like, there's a few practitioners there, like like Jill, whom I spoke to for the story. Mm -hmm. Jill Cooper, she's a therapist who deals with uh, teenagers and she's a family therapist. Mm -hmm. And there's a few other, like, medical practitioners. They were given more time because of, uh, you know, dealing with mm -hmm. patient Patients. laws and give, giving them more time to find a new therapist if needed. Right. So they got some more time. I think most people... Until uh, September 30th, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think if, if you're, like, a dance group and you rent space every now and then... Uh, you, you're pretty much given like 30 days. Okay. There's quite a few. Are any, are any of the tenants allowed to stay there, like to legally stay, or they're all out? As far as I know, every tenant oh, okay, got, got thought, it. Okay. Yeah, and it's um, right. A few of them were given the option of like, like the dance groups we mentioned. Um, they could apply for permits, like special use permits, to come in for concerts now and then. Mm -hmm. But um, they just can't do what they've been doing so far, which is basically be tenants, have right. a lease, and not have any other additional permitting requirements. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about the audit. What are they hoping um, will come out from this audit? Well, um, the, the audit is meant to address kind of the survey from January and to some extent. Uh, I mean, I think um, one of the reasons we're writing about this is because, I mean, I'm as puzzled as anyone else as to why the scores are dropping. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out why that's happening. And, and the city council is too, and for them, it has like real repercussions. I mean, every year, during budget season, we have calls for, do, should we hire more code enforcement officers? Mm -hmm. What can we do to improve this? Do we need improvement? Is it just a perception thing? So um, the, the, the new survey is trying to kind of shed some light on that. Um, the, the council added $20,000 uh, to kind of, for this national organization called the National Research Center, which does this annual thing, to craft like a special survey that focused specifically on code enforcement in the built environment. And the idea is that once that survey is done, um, the auditor, the city council, and all the residents will kind of have a better idea of what's working in code enforcement, what's not working. And, and the planning department itself is really excited. Uh, like the planning director told me, she really wants to know that too because, I mean, she added a code enforcement position last year, James Stevens, whom I spoke to. Mm -hmm. uh, they have way more cases to get resolved much quicker. Yeah. Leave blowers, you know, are being enforced now, and yeah. yet the score still plummeted. So it's kind and of maybe you can get streamlined kind of if they can see kind of where some of the hangups are. They could streamline it. Yeah, perhaps, mm -hmm. or or if it, they'll have a better idea of is is the focus kind of in the wrong areas, or is it just the fact that there's not enough people? Those kinds of things, mm -hmm. or at least they'll know what sorts of issues are creating anxieties. Is it the zoning things? Is it the fact that Edgewood Plaza didn't have a supermarket for, right. for so long and maybe that was a perception issue mm -hmm. that kind of spilled over to other areas? Yeah. Or is it more kind of parochial, something right in front of your property happening that you're upset about? Mm -hmm. So presumably once the survey is done, um, there will be a better idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In your cover story that you wrote um, last week, um, were the code enforcement officers, um, what was their, what did they have to say? What was their perspective on maybe what some of the issues might have been? Well, we went through some of the major cases. Mm -hmm. I, I talked to like to James and to you know Hillary Gilman, the planning director, about like the Asian box issue and the CC restaurant issue. And at the time I spoke to them, um, CC was considered in compliance, even though they're open to the public like four and a half hours a week mm -hmm. in, a, in a site that's supposed to be that was listed as extensive retail on right. their permit. Mm -hmm. And I think. To people who are critics of the way code enforcement is operating, that's like a total scam. Mm -hmm. Like you basically have a warehouse and you open it for five hours a week and you could use this retail site. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, the neighborhood loses like a real retail site that's supposed to be open full time. 
But at the time I spoke to them, which was you know, about a month ago, uh, they considered it to be in compliance because they have regular hours, even though the regular hours mm. are like a few hours. Right. Since then, I feel like, um, you know, and then I was writing the story and then a few days before my publication date, actually, they informed me that they took action against mm -hmm. CC. Yeah. And so they sent him this really strongly worded letter saying, you need to have change your business model or vacate the site. Mm -hmm. So they really clamped down, but that was like, really the story really shifted i think like in the last few weeks wow. which made some of the critics a little suspicious you know then you get the criticism of it's like oh they knew the story's coming so they had to oh, do this interesting and I'm, I'm not suggesting that's what happened right. Co correlation doesn't mean causation but right. um but certainly the fact that that property has been in the spotlight uh, probably made them more likely to do more inspections and follow up and kind of make sure the mm -hmm. rules are being followed and yeah. asian box as well like when i was interviewing um james and hillary uh they were just in the process of kind of um requesting that the the former Palo Alto Bank, I think it's called Gracie Jones, the yeah. free bake shop now, they were in the process of uh, following up with them and uh, getting them to kind of remove some of their office spaces from the from the site and right. install customer well, seating. So what is the Gracie Jones site supposed to be used for? Well, it's a retail site. It's in the Midtown neighborhood. So general office use is prohibited there, okay. like even with the permit. So um, you could have kind of like customer representative desks, I mean, and which is kind of how code enforcement initially interpreted these workstations. And so uh, people are worried it's being operated more as more an, as an office. office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're saying they're basically circumventing the restriction by creating an office and calling it a creative space. Uh, since then, um, you know, code enforcement did send them a letter saying you need to add more customer seating. And then, um, and they basically, the Asian Box CEO, Frank Klein, basically said that they've repurposed the kind of working areas to now... Um, to allow customers to use the computers to print things out or whatnot, mm -hmm. which um, I haven't followed up. I haven't seen if that's actually true, if anyone's using that. Okay. <laughs> but that's kind of the latest um, iteration of how they say that building is being used for. Mm. And and they, they do have, you know, donuts and cookies, gluten-free. And I think well, you, and you could cater Asian box stuff out there. So, okay. so it still has some retail. Mm -hmm. just yeah, and it seems like it needs to kind of be part of the neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. That's part, that's written into the... Code. Yeah, it needs to serve the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It has to be like a neighborhood serving business, or at least um, ma many of the businesses like the, for example, the CC restaurant site, they're meant to be, if you're going to be like an office, you know, in those rare cases, or it has to be like a neighborhood serving, like a travel agency or that kind of stuff that people mm -hmm. from the neighborhood would come in. Um, but I think one of the things that people are having a real problem with is a lot of these offices really aren't that. You would have like a headquarters of like a multinational high tech company mm -hmm. based in China on the same block. Um, so, and, and so, we, we, which goes to say basically, this is not even code enforcement. This is kind of like the way other planning staff interpret the code. Mm -hmm. that, that's also kind of an issue, which goes to the heart of why people get so frustrated. Yeah. And I wonder if this kind of this tension that's arising is mm -hmm. part is part of it speaks to the change in Palo Alto, right? Mm -hmm. Um, companies coming here and kind of trying to make the code kind of conform to what they're trying to do. Um, Absolutely. I mean, Palo Alto is known as a creative, innovative place, and it's also known as a place where people take land use very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these two things kind of clash. And yeah. um, I mean, anybody who watches Silicon Valley knows that uh, at least when it comes to startups, mm -hmm. residential zoning codes don't always apply to how companies operate. Mm -hmm. Again, that is fictional, but that's not to say that there aren't some houses um, around uh, Palo Alto where, that, I mean, these kinds of things happen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the city recently did also unveil a new service. Um, like it, it's, it has this building eye platform where you could look at different planning applications. And just this month, they added code enforcement there. So you can actually look at where various complaints are. And just by clicking at some of these circles, you could see that there's all sorts of like garages repurposed into like working rooms, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So, um, yeah, the desire of people to have their quiet, leafy, kind of suburban character neighborhoods is sometimes uh, kind of clashes with the desire of companies to be able to yeah. start up. And it seems like a lot of these issues arise from how people are defining um, the code, right? <laughs> and kind of like mm, taking liberties in some cases or... Or um, maybe saying, oh, well, this is a very strict definition. Um, kind of like the pastor um, of First Baptist, one of the quotes um, mm -hmm. in your story was that, um, you know, he was kind of speaking to a lot of, uh, you know, what, 
what's defined, what are the operations defined mm -hmm. um, for a church? Like maybe that's too strict. Um, yes, and, and the pastor was you know, very adamant about that. He thinks actually that the city's action uh, might run afoul of the, you know, of the, like the constitutional rights to use the church as the church needs to be used, mm -hmm. not to mention making it no longer financially viable for them to upkeep the property, which is quite right. sizable. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like code enforcement would say, we simply follow the rules, here they are. Um, mm -hmm. If it's a good company, bad company, whatever. If, the, if it's illegal for them to be here, we have to do what we have to do with the code enforcement. The same way as, you know, as a police officer, you know, if you're driving 80 miles an hour, they pull you over despite, without knowing who you are. Yeah. But also, much like the police officer, there is discretion. They, they do let right. some people off the hook. They work with people. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, something James Stevens told me is, you know, if you're like 80 years old and you have a ton of stuff in your front yard, you need to get rid of. They might treat you different than if you were like, you know, 20 year old, able bodied, and could easily do this stuff in a couple of days. So, mm -hmm. on the one hand, they say we strictly follow the codes. Black and on, white. On the yeah. other hand, there is this, there is discretion and. And the, fa and the fact that the codes could be interpreted in different ways just adds another layer of complexity and gives, you know, another opportunity to people who don't like what's happening yeah. to, kind of, to kind of challenge. The well, way I think your stories taken. definitely show that it's not a black and white issue. It's yeah. lots of shades, of, lots of shades of gray. And it's, 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 it's very open to interpretation. Yeah. Right? Is there anything else that you wanted to add? I think we covered it. Just just to say that um, the, the survey is going to come out, I think, sometime in the fall or later this year. and. Um, like many people in Palo Alto, I look forward to seeing what it says and writing about it. Yeah. Okay, that wraps up this week's Behind the Headlines. If you want to hear more, click the subscribe button below. Or if you want to uh, learn more about Palo Alto News, go to paloaltoonline.com.